And I want you and I to consider the beauty of the majestic message of that book called the Holy Quran that we have yet to truly understand and live. But think about it. The life of a Muslim, when we first are awakened, is to give praise and thanks to the source of life. There's no better way you can start the day than to recognize the source of your existence and show gratitude and humility for an opportunity to live. So it's a very wonderful thing. Many people will get up this morning and they will reach for a cigarette. It's first thing they want, smoke. Some will run to the kitchen for coffee. Some will run for alcohol. Some will actually go out and start running and jogging for an hour and they will run. But very few people have been exposed to the true nature of living the natural life of the creature that Allah has made to reflect the best of all of his creation. I always say that in my humble observation, everything Allah has made in this universe, he has made it for the benefit of humanity. But he made the human being for him, meaning for his exclusive worship and service. Because in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَدَخَلَ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمٍ we created the human being in the very best of molds. That in your natural self, you are as good as you will ever be. If you live like a natural man and a natural woman. But if we deviate from nature, then we become the worst of the worst. So he says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمٍ ثُمَّ رَدَدَنَاهُ then those who are rejectors of truth, we have reduced them to the lowest of the low. And we can see from world affairs, as well as from history, what is the nature of the human being when they become savages. How does men and women behave in the absence of divine guidance? Now, as I was thinking, I was listening to the Quran as the Imam recited and I reflect upon that this Surah Al-Fatiha that we read every day. Why? This prayer is God's gift to us. It's a Quranic revelation. It is a verse of the Quran or verses, but it's our opening prayer. Before we recite any of the chapters of the Quran, Every single day, according to the scholars of Islam, the Surah Al-Fatiha is mandatory for the recitation in the prayer, for the prayer to be accepted. That if you don't recite anything else, you must recite Al-Fatiha. Now what is in the Surah? That it's mandatory that I recite it. Let's go just through a little bit. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the most merciful. Is there need for mercy? Is there need for beneficence? Of course, in the absence of Allah's mercy, none of us could be here. Without his mercy, we wouldn't be here. Because all of us at some point in our lives, we disobey his command. And the difference between shaitan and Adam in their moments of disobedience is one disobeyed out of ignorance and one disobeyed out of arrogance. So it's very important as a Muslim, whether I'm a king, a father, a mother, a teacher, a business personnel, whatever we are, it's very important that we, when we make mistakes, that we are humble. You know, not that I want to mention his name, because I don't, but he is an example of the tragedy of the human experience. Mr. Donald Trump was asked, do you ask God for forgiveness? He said, for what? I don't do anything wrong. Me and God have a good relationship. Really? 
You don't ask God for forgiveness? The prophets ask for forgiveness. The righteous men and women of all ask for forgiveness. But you see yourself in, a, in the manner that is like the modern pharaohs and the pharaohs of history. What manner of man would say that when he speaks to God, he has no need to ask God for his forgiveness? For even when we think we know, we discover later we don't know. Sometimes we have convictions and we're 100% committed to what we believe. And as we live long enough, we say, you know what? We were wrong. In spite of all the gathering of intelligence, Colin Powell at the United Nations gave a persuasive presentation that the people of Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. And he spoke with sincerity. And he was convinced of his own material. But he was deceived. But he never thought he would be deceived because he thought he was one of them. But they gave him false information. Two million people dead. Thousands injured. Country destroyed. And the leaders of the world do not even have the humility to say, we are wrong and we're sorry. You ever have your children sometime do something wrong? You say, Abdullah, come here. Say sorry. And he just looks at you. It's something about the word sorry that kids know. Try it. When one of your kids do something, tell them, come here. Say sorry now. And they'll just look at you. Say sorry. I have a daughter, one of my daughters, Maya. She won't say sorry. She's only two. I have to work with her maybe for two or three hours. Then I have to bribe her. I say, well, when I hear you say sorry, then I'll get the ice cream out the refrigerator. Now in self-interest, she says, Sorry, but she's not really saying sorry to say sorry. She's saying sorry, why? What does she want? And that's the nature of the human being, self-interest. So, we say in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, all praise in all forms belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, if you look at the human family, we are conditioned to seek praise. How many people you think would love to be famous? Do you know why Facebook is so famous? Because it caters to the individual's aspiration to be known. That's all it does. I'll tell you right now, let's say you take a picture with someone very powerful and they put the picture tomorrow in the newspaper. When you go get the paper, who are you looking for? Who's the first person you want to see in that picture? You want to see you. Sometimes when we have a large community and it's multiple and it's diverse and we got different people from the world of Islam, all of us are in the same masjid and we have to choose a leader or a president or a representative. Some of us, we have private meetings in our home because we want one of us to be in charge. Well, brother, who's going to be in charge? Well, brother, you know, uh, the Arabs want to, they, 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 they want to do that. Well, you know, the Pakistanis want to do this. Well, you know, the Somalians, we have to do this. Well, the African Americans, we have to do that. Well, you know, we also have to consider the women. And the women have to, but the youth say, well, we need to be in charge too. See, that's not really the spirit of a Muslim. The spirit of a Muslim is to look for those who are best qualified to take us to the next level of our development and give that person 100% commitment and support to make us successful. You know where you see that at? In sports. You ever see a basketball or a football game? How many of you are Seahawks fa Seahawk fans here? Raise your hand. They're like, is this a trick? No, honestly, there's nothing wrong with sports. Raise your hand if you like the Seahawks. You should be a Seahawks fan, it's just, this your team. Now, no person on that team can win the championship and the Super Bowl, no matter how great that one person is, no one person will bring victory to the team. So in sports, they put all differences aside in order to win against an opposing team. See, they got us twisted. To win a Super Bowl and a ring, 
and to get the glory of fame and fortune for sports, they teach us, put aside all differences. Forget about your race, your religion, your political philosophy. We are Seahawks and we will be victorious. We will crush the Jets and the Giants. Whoever comes, we are in Seahawk town. We, and, and, and the arena gets full. And from the airport to the bakery, to the university, to the governor's office, people got on Seahawks memorabilia and everybody's dedicated because in the spirit of unity, we are most successful. In the spirit of unity, with all due respect, America can never be successful, nor can she be secure without cooperation with the international community. Never can a country that lives on the planet Earth that is shared by almost seven billion people. The days of empire and conquest is over. The human family has expanded and there has been an awakening and there is competition across the globe. That's why in Microsoft, if I go to Microsoft right now, I guarantee you, the number one people in Microsoft that's running Microsoft in terms of the workforce, they're probably even from India, or China. I probably could be inside Microsoft building and think I'm in India. And I guarantee you some of the work that America does, it's most strategic work. I guarantee you while we're sleeping, the people in India who are up, they're working and you get it back through the computer in the morning. You go to your desk and oh, look at that. They completed all the files to perfection. Because one of the things that makes the people of India and other countries successful is that where there is some sense of poverty and competition, there is a spirit of hunger. You must always stay hungry. Never ever lose your hunger for greatness. Don't lose it. Don't lose your hunger. I was asking myself, why was the Prophet وسلم, keeping himself in a state of fasting. That's a state of hunger. What was he yearning for? He had access to food. People say Prophet Muhammad was poor. No, the Prophet was never poor. Your definition of poverty does not fit him. The Prophet had before he died, peace be upon him, the Prophet had more than 100,000 followers. You think he could not have had a meal every day? You think with 100,000 followers, if he wanted a mansion, they would not have built it? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was a rich man. Uthman was a rich man. Do you think those Sahaba would have not made sure the Prophet ate every single day? Of course they would have made sure. But he discovered something based upon divine revelation. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the commandment to fast for Ramadan, it was for the purpose of the awakening of the spiritual man and women. Huh? كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ السِّيَامِ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So in the pursuit of taqwa, which is the peak of God consciousness, he became the embodiment of the Qur'an. So Aisha رضي الله عنه, when she was asked, what is the character of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم? She said, كَانَ خُلُقُهُ الْقُرْآن That verily the Prophet's character is the embodiment of the Qur'an. So now let's take for an example. I say, my name is Abdul Rahman. And we translate that as being what? The servant of? The servant of Abdul Rahman. No, the servant of what? The merciful. What does that mean? Does it simply mean that I take on the name that I'm the servant of the merciful? Or as the servant of Allah, am I a deliverer of mercy? I bring mercy on behalf of my creator. If I am the source of the expression of the attributes of God, then I'm the best instrument to manifest to humanity some of his divine qualities. No, we will never become God, but we have the qualities as human beings to manifest on a small scale some of his divine qualities. Can you imagine if I said, on this day, I will be a deliverer of mercy that as I find people in my pathway, instead of being angry and bitter, I will have mercy. Can you imagine what life would be like? But the first person we should show mercy to in our lives is ourselves. You cannot show mercy to others when you put yourself down. 
I find people in the religious community sometimes, especially in the Muslim community, in light of all that is going on, sometimes we are our worst critics and we are not our own supporters. We do not see the greatness and the goodness in ourselves. Just look at how many people came out this morning for prayer, for example. You know how beautiful this is? That people are waiting in the parking lot. I came a little earlier. Either the time on the website is wrong or my eyes fooled me. Because I thought it said that the Fajr was at 6.02. That's what I thought I read last night. And I said, and then I started thinking, in all of my years of being a Muslim, I've never seen any masjid make prayer at 6.02 or 5.02. It may be 6.20 or 6.30. And then I was in the parking lot and said, well, what better place could I wait to be open than the masjid? Some people wait for a club to open and they go early. Some people wait for the shopping mall. People sleep outside Walmart because they have been deceived in program during the month of Black Friday. People are sleeping outside of Walmart and Best Buy. Some are even out there with their Qurans in their hand, waiting to get a sale, to push to get a television deception. Wasting all of that time to save what they think is money. It's a gimmick. It's a gimmick. Because the TVs, and all the merchandise is already marked up. I was in Macy's one day, and I said to the lady, you have all these sale signs. I was just here the other day, the prices are the same. She said, well, you know, it's business. So you walk in, it says big sale, 20% off, 30% off, an additional 10% off if you apply for the Macy's credit card. But that 10% is 100% of interest that when you start purchasing on the card, you start getting billed every month because you don't want to pay the whole bill. The same shirt that will cost you $20 cash, you're not thinking about it, but you didn't spend $150 on a shirt. Because they know that it's in the nature of the human being to rush. Huh? Man is a creature. And when I say man, I mean man and women. We are creatures of haste. We want success overnight. It won't happen overnight. We are the seeds of a new future. Right now in America, we are the seeds of a new future. And if you look at the Prophet Sallallahu life, one of the things Allah showed us is that when he changed direction, he changed his leadership. The Muslims used to pray towards what? Baked al maqdas right? When Allah decided to change the direction, He changed the leadership. After Bani Israel were recipients of divine revelation for so long, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided that He would choose someone outside of them for a new direction and for a new people that will be all-inclusive for all of humanity. And look at the wisdom. Because Allah changed the direction, we can make Hajj. If Hajj was in Jerusalem, how many of us would be able to get in right now? Allah is a master planner. We see things from a very short distance, but Allah sees things into the eternity of time, which he is the author of. And so one of the things that I'm learning is that just be grateful and thankful to Allah for where you may be. Wherever you may be, even if you are struggling with your prayers and you get to your prayer, you say, you know, I'm struggling. When you get to the prayer rank, after being distracted, say, Allah, thank you so much. Please, Allah, make me a better Muslim. Make me more focused. Make me more appreciative. Let me see the beauty of what I have not been able to see because of all the distractions. Because if you watch Fox News, you get depressed. If you pick up the newspaper, you get depressed. But if you pick up the Quran, you will forever be inspired. Because everything that you see has been done before. There's nothing new. The only thing that is new is the manifestation of old things. For example, the bird has always been flying. But we have a plane now. But that's not the first time men and women have traveled the world. We used to walk. We used to ride horses. We used to use boats and sail. Now we got speed boats. Well, the boat is not new. The manner in which it moves now is new. Now we have cars that you can program to tell the car on the GPS where you want to go. When I want to find a masjid, I say, Sari, take me to the closest Islamic center. And Sari comes, which Islamic center would you like to have? That's deep. That Allah SWT has given the human being the ingenuity to create a device that you could speak to and could respond to you like a human being would respond with intelligence. That tells you something about the magnitude of greatness that's built into us. And I noticed something. You know the people that create and who aspire for greatness, they have a different lifestyle than regular people. 
You won't find people that are dedicated to success wasting time with news. They probably don't even watch the news. They don't got time for the news because their mind is, is set. Those people that are developing new technology so the blind can see. I have a, a young lady who's a family member of mine. She had eye surgery. She couldn't see. And they put inside of her eye, they sewed a lens that is so thin, when you look at her eyes now, it looked like the eyes of a toy teddy bear. It's so glassy. And she opened her eyes, she said, I can see 2015 now. She can see better than me. She looks at buildings and tells me the detail fine print in tall buildings, the detail fine print in the bricks. I can't see it, she can see it. What were the people doing who developed that technology? You think they were wasting time in playing? No. Because people who find their purpose in life, they are dedicated to that purpose in order to be successful. And today, what I would say to us as Muslims, we need a new paradigm shift. We need to ask ourselves, what should be our primary focus? Number one, as Muslims who live in America. Because I don't know about what happens every morning in Kashmir or Afghanistan. I don't know, I don't speak the language of the people of Afghanistan. I don't know how to help everybody in Nigeria, but I do know one thing, that if Muslims in America are successful, you can help people all over the world. If you are successful in this country with money and education and human relationships, you can change the lives of people all over the world because this is the empire state of the world. Let me give you a simple example. Let's say this master says, you know what we're gonna do this year? We are going to give glasses to children and elderly. And our goal is one million pair of glasses. People say, let's give da'wah, let's give da'wah. And they think da'wah is talking to people about Islam and giving books and pamphlets, you know, that's a part of da'wah. But the greatest da'wah you can give to deliver this message is your lifestyle. Most people will never read the Quran in their life, but they will meet a Muslim or see something that is reflective of Islam. So just imagine that we said, you know, we want one million pairs of glasses, glasses that are used. And we go to our neighbor and say, listen, on behalf of uh, whatever the corporation you want to call it, you don't have to say the Islamic Center or call it maps, and people, oh, I don't know about that. Are you guys gonna be using these glasses for terrorist activity? Are you gonna, you know, you can say, you know, we have a corporation called Let Humanity See, or The Beauty of Sight, Inc., non for profit. See, we think everything has to be, hey, I'm a Muslim, look at me. No, you don't have to do that. Sometimes people say, brother, you know, when you give people something, you should let them know you're a Muslim. No, I don't need to do that. I don't need to let people know what I am. I need to know that when I do a good deed, that in my heart I did it for the glory of Allah, not so people can see me as someone good. See, that's where we lose focus. I don't really care how people see me. How they see me is not as significant as how they get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remove yourself from the equation and let Allah get the glory. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Some people will not do a good deed unless they get press coverage. If they're gonna give out food, they say make sure you make a media kit. Okay, let the press know we're giving out 10,000 bottles of water. I had Muslims call me, say, brother, Abdul Malik, are you going up to Flint, Michigan? I said, for what? To take the people water. I said, brother, let's do the math. The money I will spend to take them the water can be wisely used and just go on and buy the water right there. Call Costco's, call Walmart, buy a caseload or a truckload of water and tell the people that they can pick up the water themselves or pay someone local to deliver the water to the people. But I don't need a tractor trailer that says Islamic Organization of America. You taking $500 of water and spending $2,000 to get there. It don't make sense. We don't need that press coverage because the people of Flint need more than water. They need more than water. The poor people in America are neglected, rejected, and disenfranchised, and no one that runs for political office speaks to the poor. They always say we have to keep the middle class. Well, what about the poor people? What about the men and women that have no food for their children? 
What about the people that live in the streets? What about the veterans who have come back that live in the subway and eat out the garbage cans? What about the elderly who have given America all of their young years that have to decide now between buying medication and paying their mortgage or having a plate of food on their table? What about those people who have given all they could give to the country? We don't care about them no more. We already used you up. Go home. Die. That's the philosophy in a capitalistic institution. If it doesn't make money, we don't care about it. That's capitalism at its worst. The bottom line is money. Money, 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 money. Some people worship money. They live for money. That's all they think about every day is money. Some people wake up in the morning, the first thing they run for is their computer. Let me check my account. Let me check the stock market. And they always feel a sense of content based on the deception that as long as I have money, I'm safe and secure. And then you go to the doctor one day and they say, you know, you got cancer. Oh my God. And all the money you have, you can't find a cure. Or you're going blind. Or you're losing your sight. Or you can't hear. Or you have malfunctions in your kidney. See, they have deceived us. They have deceived us. The world has been a, 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 a place of deception by a few. People say one man or one woman can't change the world. That's a lie. One of us in here, in this community, can make an impact on America and the world that can change the lives of generations. Mr. Bill Gates, did he not make an impact? If you take Microsoft out of here right now, and Amazon, and a few other companies, what's left in Seattle besides the beautiful rain in the hills? Starbucks. <laughs> And it's what so many people can serve coffee, but you're left with Starbucks. So what am I saying? I want to go back to, let's say we gave out a million pair of glasses. What would that do to the kid that says, wait a minute, I remember that man. Mommy, that's the man, yeah, the guy right there with the thing on his head. That's the, that's, those are the people that gave me my glasses. That kid will become for you a voice in your absence. Yes, because he got glasses. Have you ever forgotten the people that touched your life as a child who did something magnificent for you that you said, wow, you know, they changed my life. I have found people that even though their countries were invaded and occupied by colonial rulers, they still feel a sense of gratitude and a connection to the colonizers. I've seen it. And psychologically, they don't even understand they've been programmed. Like no matter what the British have done, people say we have to be thankful to the British because they came, they conquered, we served them, but they gave us English. Yeah, they gave you English. Did you know what they took from you? The resources, 800 years, the devastation it cost your people. Do you know what it has taken from you? Oh, no, no, no. They built a railway system. They gave us trains. Really, a train? You didn't see what, what the price was? So now, I go back, doing something simple. We say, you know what? We don't have a lot, but all of us, we have more than one pair of shoes. I don't think there's anybody, especially my ladies. Some sisters got 200 pair of shoes in their closet, and they only wear once or twice with one outfit. Because one thing that women have in the culture is the outfit is not complete until the shoes match. Shoes gotta match. You can be with your wife or your daughters in the mall for two or three hours looking for them shoes. Those shoes are important. I remember I told one sister to donate some of her shoes. She said, Abdul Malik, don't touch those shoes. I will give you a donation and some money. Those shoes, don't you even think about it. Because they've created a culture within the women community that shoes, shoes, shoes. If you go in DSW, I think it's called, right? About 10% of the store has men's shoes. And the other 90% of the store is all women's shoes. And I go in there sometimes just to watch. And I say, wow, they got us. They got us. Two or three hours looking for a pair of shoes. Now, the men, they got us too. We want that car. Oh, it's something about a man in a car. Oh, we got to have a car. Oh, I'm going to make dua. What's your prayer for Ramadan? Oh, Allah, give me that car. I need that car, yeah, Allah. I mean, really, we insult Allah. These simple little things, these are toys. You know, they say the difference between a man and a boy is the price of their toys. These cars and box houses, you know. I was looking around recently, I said, you know, Islamic architecture is very different 
from Western architecture. The Western architectural structure, if you look at it, everything is a box. The office is a box, the car is a box, the casket is a box, the graveyard is a box, everything is a box. You have to think in the box. Just go look. The next time you go out here, I want you to see all the new construction is all a dimensional of a square. That's all it is. It's a square box. Even the SUV, you know, the Cadillac and $80,000, $100,000, it looks like me, it looks to me like a hearse. You know, like you, where they put the caskets for the dead? I said, they just made a big hearse. It's a big hearse. And people are watch, you know, we get the SUV, you know, when you come to the masjid, mashallah, and you have that little raggedy car. I'm going to close out, inshallah. You have that little raggedy car, you park it at the end of the parking lot, and you walk and you say, I get barakah for every step I take. <laughs> But when you get that new car, mashallah, that Mercedes S5, you get that Mercedes, you get that Bentley, whoa, Maserati, whoa, you pull up to the masjid, you turn the music off when you get off the highway and you put the Quran on, you pull up to the masjid and you come in slow and the windows are down. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. How are you doing? And brother say, MashaAllah, brother, Allah has blessed you, really. So your life was not a blessing in the absence of a vehicle. And the car makes you feel a certain way. You feel successful. You feel like you made it. Until you get the bill for the next three or four years. And the new car starts looking dirty. And it starts looking dirty, and you start saying, wow, I'm in this contract for the next three years, and it's $2,500 a month. And if I get out of the contract, it's going to mess up my credit, and then I'm not going to be able to buy the house. Well, if you were smart, you'd have bought the house before you bought the car. Because the house, in some cases, would have produced some equity for you. And you could have paid off the car with cash. But we have this illusion of success. And it's not just in the material world, even in the religious sense. You know? Sometimes when we want to think that we're being super religious, I watch. You give the brother the greetings. You go, Salaam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brother. Alhamdulillah, brother. How are you doing? Oh, brother. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. We thank Allah. What's all this for? What's this for? What's all this body language for? Oh, we grab the Holy Quran and. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> and then when we leave, we go home for five hours and we watch TV. Yes, yeah, subhanAllah. You kiss the Quran like they kiss the black stone. It's all, it's all false symbolism. There's a substance to it. Like sometimes I'll meet a brother, he say, Brother, alhamdulillah, I'm trying to be a great Muslim. Right? And no doubt, the, the beard is sunnah. No doubt. The first thing he thinks to manifest his religiosity is he starts growing his beard. I say, brother, mashallah, your beard looks nice, but let's go to the barber, just make it neat. No, brother, no, brother, don't touch this. I say, brother, you have hair hanging. No, brother, this sunnah, I don't want to lose the barakah. Brother, it's okay to look decent. It's okay to trim and be nice and presentable. Or you have your thobe on, you, you go home, you get rid of the suits. I don't want the suits no more. You put your thobe on. And you wear the thobe, you don't iron it, you got mustard over here, ketchup there, you got a safety pen here, and you got your thicker beads falling apart, but you feel religious. People do it in Christianity. I was talking to the lady on the plane, and uh, she said, you know, this is a Christian country. She said, we have to thank sweet Jesus. She was about 72 years old. When she said, sweet Jesus, I said, I know where this is going. As soon as I said to her, ma'am, do you really think America is a Christian country? She looked at me like, I said, considering our history. I said, you know, with stealing land from the Indians, that's an ungodly act. And killing over 100 million natives, that's pretty, uh, I think that's pretty wicked. I said, and having slavery for almost 400 years, and then having the Emancipation Proclamation, then establishing Jim Crow laws, I said, that's pretty evil, wouldn't you say so? I said, you don't think Jesus would be in the business of destruction of humanity, do you? She wouldn't talk to me no more. <laughs> and then I realized I had made a mistake. I said, you started too early. So as the plane, as we kept flying, we had another hour. She said, can you hold my water for me? Because she had to get up. I said, sure. And then, 
I shouldn't tell you this, but I'm gonna tell you. When I talk to people, sometimes I've learned that in dealing with human beings, they only agree with you, not because you say something new, but you say what they already believe. So I said to her, man, isn't Trump fantastic? He'll be a great president. She looked, she lit up. Oh, I didn't know if I could say that. She said, he's the best. He'll be the best president we ever had. Trump is the man we need. You see those terrorists? They know if we elect Trump, we ain't playing. That's why Barack Obama made the deal he made with the Iranians, because he knows Trump is coming. And when Trump comes to blow that trumpet, we're gonna go and get it to him. We're gonna, oh, we're gonna kill them. They're evil people. I said, really? She said, and you know what? With Trump, we're gonna take back our country. I said, take back the country. Yes, from these Mexicans. You know the ones that come here and steal and rob and rape and they destroy us? Yeah, and those firing the Muslim people. And I'm just sitting there looking. Now, and you know what, honestly? I was entertained by her, but I felt so sorry. I said, this lady is 72 years old and she as dumb as a kindergartner. That you mean to tell me you lived this long and your heart is filled with such hatred? And you know what her reference was? You know what her reference was for truth? Fox News. SubhanAllah, Fox News. And see, as I was explaining yesterday, a lot of people in religion, a lot of people in religious institutions are some of the most wicked people in history. They conquer people's land. They give you food if you take the Bible. You know, the, the people do these things, right? They had a cup they was using in Africa with water, but at the bottom it had written in it, Jesus. So would kid drink the water? Jesus. You want a bowl of soup? Jesus. Would you like to go to school? It's from Jesus. This is all deception. It's all deception. People will feed you if you accept their doctrine. That's not the spirit of a Muslim. We will feed those whom Allah said we should feed. Allah said we should feed the poor, the hungry. We should free the slaves. We should do what we must do, not because of a person's religious beliefs, but because it is our duty to humanity. So, I end with this. We don't have long to live, even if you live for another 50 to 100 years. At some point, we have to go. Try to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a life that has meaning that is beyond men and women's description of who we should be. You know, people, everybody would tell us who we should be. Like I was talking to the brothers yesterday and I wasn't trying to be offensive, right? But two things, like when something happens in America that's negative, right? And a shooting goes on, we all go, oh Allah, please don't let it be a Muslim. Why you have accepted this burden that if a Muslim does something, all of us collectively now, we are responsible for what they have done. A man was shooting up the hotel the other day. You know what the headline said? Man shoots the hotel. Never mention his religion or his country. But if a Muslim does it, it's front page news. Why? Because it's organized propaganda. And that's what they're supposed to do. If you read the Quran, the verse is clear. Allah says, yuriduna. They desire to put out the words or the light of Allah with their mouths, but Allah will perfect this light even if the unbelievers reject it. So what is the mouth? It is the place where what is in the heart is communicated. What's in here comes off the tongue. That's why it's important when you meet people for the first time, listen to them. Let them speak. Don't cut them off. Because only what, when you know what a man is thinking or what a woman is thinking, can you offer an alternative view? So you listen. Now, we don't have long. We have to find something in life that we can do with all of our hearts. Let's say, for example, you say, you know, Brother Abdul Malik, I really want to do something with my life. I work, alhamdulillah, I have a nice house, alhamdulillah, we have, we have, we have the dunya, we have it. But I'm empty inside. That emptiness, is a gift from Allah to let you know that you're missing out on the reality. That there's something that you should be doing. Nobody may even agree with you and that's good. The less people agree with you, the better off you will be. If everybody agrees with you, you're not at your best. You know you're on the road to success when the majority of the people do not agree nor can they see what you see. 
You think people saw Microsoft? I'm sure if you talk to Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, if he was alive, and you ask them, give me your story, I bet you they can tell you things that happened to them, how many doors slammed, how many people rejected them, how many people thought they was crazy for the ideas that they possessed, but guess what? They were fueled by hunger because they knew that things could be done better on a more perfect level, and they went for it. And so now, mashallah, we used to go to the post office, right? Lick a stamp, put in the envelope, go down to the mailbox, put it in, wait three or four days or a week, all right, for it to get to its final destination. Now, a young man from India, I forgot his name. You know, he created Gmail. Gmail was created by a young man from India. That at the press of a button now, just press a button, you can send a letter any place in the world in less than 30 seconds. SubhanAllah. Those people who develop the technology, they're not time wasters because they're committed to something that's bigger than sport and play. So in my conclusion, I'm asking you and myself, find something in life that you can do that is bigger than you, that is bigger than the time you have been given, that even in your death, you are still alive in the hearts and minds of the people. See, when I see Muslim children, whenever I go to a masjid, the number one thing I'm looking for is kids. If I don't see kids in the masjid or programs for the children, I know that community won't be successful because the next generation must carry on the works that we're trying to do. So the children, whenever I see Muslim children, I know more so in my heart, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan for Islam in America. He has a plan. See your kids who are born in America, they don't have your mindset. You know how you have the mind, I'm gonna make some money and go back home, or I can't say that because I don't wanna get deported, or I can't say that because they're gonna label me as a terrorist. You don't, your children don't think like that unless you make them think like that. Like if you start telling your kids all the things they have to be scared of, then you're gonna put in them a seed of fear that's gonna cripple them and destroy their ambitions for greatness. If you start telling the kids, you know, we, we may have to leave America because they're rejecting us and we're Americans and uh, you know, don't feed your children that. You tell your children, no matter what happens, we trust in Allah and we will follow the example of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we will with patience endure because Allah has promised us victory if we believe. Yeah, you have to tell them that. They say, well, well, well Baba, what if they take my house? What if they take our house? No problem, son. Allah will give us another house, if not 10 more. What if they kick me out of school? Doesn't matter, we'll make our own schools. Well, Baba, what if they fire you? Don't worry about that, I'll make my own job. Some things we should never share with our children because as children, they don't need to be burdened with the foolishness of adults. Children need to be allowed to stay in an environment that reflects their ability to manifest their creativity. You should not tell your kids about everything that's in the media. You shouldn't tell your kids, oh, they're hating on Muslims. Don't tell them that. Don't put that in their mind. They don't even need to know about that. What your children need to know is that by the grace of Allah, anything they desire to be, it is possible by the grace of Allah. Anything. You want to be the president? You can be. You think that the American people and the generations before us, you think they even considered that America would have a president one day with the name Barack Hussein Obama? Come on, come on, come on. You couldn't have told, you, you, could have, you could not have told that to J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI who was trying to destroy Dr. Martin Luther King, who called Dr. King a traitor and a terrorist. You couldn't have told J. Edgar Hoover that 40 years from this day, that a man whose father is jet black from Kenya and a woman from Kansas would conceive a child who would be given the name of the grandson of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and forever have to sign that on permanent documents that belong to the history of America. You couldn't have told them that, but it happened. It happened, you know why? Because men plan and they plot, but Allah plans and he plots, and Allah is the best of planners. And I believe that we will just be fine. It will be difficult at times. It will be confusion at times. There will be doubts at times. But in the midst of doubts, we must search for the gates of hope. And with that faith in Allah, nothing is impossible, nothing. Because what we seek is not something that a human being can give you. The greatness that we seek is the barakah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of you right now, your professions, if you went back home, you wouldn't make 10% of your salary in America. 
How is it that you made it here? And there are others that are greater than you in knowledge. They have not made it to the shores of North America. You know how? It's your destiny. Allah brought you here. So enjoy this journey called life. And may Allah bless you for your time and your patience. But inshallah, inspire your children and find a purpose in life that you can contribute to the greatness of humanity that is bigger than yourself, inshallah. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Shukran. 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 Alhamdulillah. So inshallah, we invite first uh, sisters to go and take breakfast. And then inshallah, enjoy the breakfast because of... How you doing? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Good to see you, man. Alhamdulillah. Afwan Habib. Assalamualaikum. How you doing, Shaykh?